Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Stanton Peel. He is a psychologist who takes a different approach to addiction. In fact, he says that addiction is not a medical disease. He is author of many books, and including The Diseasing of America, Addiction Treatment Out of Control. Dr. Peel, welcome to the show. Thanks it's for coming on pleasure. tonight. And, uh, of course, my latest book is uh, my memoir, I'll just hold that up while I'm at it. Uh, the Scientific Life on the Edge, My Lonely Quest to Change How We See Addiction. Excellent. I haven't got a chance to get to that one yet, but I'm sure I'll be reading it soon. Um, tell me a little bit more about why you got so interested in the science or unscience of addiction. Well, I, ju I do want to correct one little thing that you said. Um there's been a lot of turmoil in the defining addiction field lately. And um, you've, have you heard of the term harm reduction? Harm yeah. reduction is not AA. Uh, there's no getting around it that harm reduction is more or less the opposite of AA in the 12-step rehab. So that was one major infiltration. And there have been a number of bestsellers now by Johan Hari, by... Um, Mark Lewis, Addiction is Not a Disease, by Carl Hart, that have kind of fulminated the field away from the idea that addiction is a disease, which I like to think I was the first person to come up with that idea. You pointed to Diseasing of America, which is 1989. But the fundamentals are, I mean, AA and the disease theory don't work. Are you under the impression, I mean, AA was created in 1939, and it became pretty much dominant in the United States in the 50s. Are you under the impression that we've done a good job licking our addiction and alcoholism problems? Is that a sense that you have? Uh, uh, no, well, I mean, I, 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 I certainly don't view it in, in those terms. Um, I view it as addictions typically as a life problem, something, uh, a habit, a, well, that's a fondness the same for something. Way that I think, um, but I just want to point to the effect of this. When we discovered tuberculosis was a disease or polio was a disease, we kind of eliminated them. You know, that was the concept. Okay, we've identified the disease and the source of a disease, and now we can attack and eradicate them. We have a different phenomenon going on with AA and the 12 steps. It's almost as though failure is redefined as success. Let me give you an example. Um, there's an, uh, a new, I think it's on Hulu, but I, I could be wrong. A single drunken woman. Have you heard of it? It's, uh, it's a stream. So I haven't it's, seen it's, it. only, it's only on the fourth session. A woman is portrayed as an alcoholic. She works in New York. Her boss fires her for being drunk at work. She assaults him. And instead of going to prison, she's put on probation. She moves back to Massachusetts with her mother, and she goes through a 30-day rehab. So you've heard this is all not very strange. The night she gets out of rehab, she goes with a friend to a bar. She isn't going to drink any alcohol. She does. She drinks too much. She gets intoxicated. She goes out to her car and drives into a bus and police come. So she's broke. She's out $5,000 to pay for the repair of the bus. And in real life, if you're on probation and you get drunk and you run into a bus, She's on probation for assault. They put you in jail. But in right. TV land, she's given a chance for recovery. And then there's a re, there's a, a sobriety meter that shows how many days she's sober. So it's not working out too well when after 30 day rehab, she gets drunk and commits another crime. But that's portrayed in a positive light almost. Well, now she's really going to learn her lesson. I, I'm only up to the third or fourth session, so the sobriety counter is clearly going to extend itself. 
Now, you might say something like, isn't there something better that could happen to you after 30-day rehab that would prepare you better? And I have something online called the Life Process Program. And one of the things that we teach is relapse prevention. Now, rehabs, AA rehabs don't teach relapse prevention. Do you know what relapse, do you have an idea of what relapse prevention might be? Mm, not really. Well, Tell relapse me more about prevention it. is, uh, this woman wasn't the only person who had a drink after she left rehab. That doesn't surprise you to learn that, I don't think. It says, well, let's practice and rehearse skills for that event. So you, hmm. we have in the life process room, we say, you know, you may not want to go to a bar, certainly the day you get out of rehab. Okay, that happens. You can go to the bar and not drink anything. That People have done that in the history of the world. You have a drink. Okay, people have had a drink and not had more drinks. Do you believe that's true? <laughs> uh, these are a lot of rhetorical questions. I, I certainly believe that's true. And she drank more. But you could remember, we're talking about a life process program and relapse prevention, which is a skill. And so you just say to the person, well, you probably shouldn't go to a bar. You go to a bar, you probably shouldn't drink. You drink, you can have one drink and you can leave. That can happen. That's a human possibility. Let's say you drink too much. Okay, that's not good. But, you know, you can still take a cab home, sleep it off, and the next day say, boy, I don't want to do that again. Or that was a bad idea. And your probation officer won't know about it. So the last stop okay. on the relapse is intoxicated. You get in your car you drive and you have an accident. All of that, and now in real life, she's up shit's creek. In the movie, she owes $5,000 and she's broke. Um, in real life, she'd be in jail, which isn't helpful. And picture this, single drunken woman is saying, well, that's a good outcome because now she's going to learn how screwed up she is and I'll, down the line, help her as opposed to a, what we normally think of as therapy and coaching is to prepare people to deal more successfully, if not perfectly, with their lives. And so, hmm. follow my logic, that rehab set her up for failure. They never, they don't have, you know, you could have one drink. That's a possibility. Don't, and look, if you drink too much, we're not... Well, on board with that, but have it installed in your mind or tell the person you're with, please call me a cab. So this doesn't turn into, which, you know, she could have gone out and killed herself or somebody. Let's not turn this into a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And that's in normal human therapy in life, that's considered a positive preparation for life because people are always, how shall I put it, making errors. I mean, nobody goes into rehab, yeah. even, and they don't, they don't believe it. People in rehab say, oh, I failed six or seven times. That shows how much I needed it. Instead, taking a non-disease approach makes you more realistic, allows you to teach realistic, acknowledge reality, and teach people skills so that they'll cope with it so that they'll have less problems in life. She's going to rehab, and if the events that were depicted in Single Drunken Woman occurred, she'd be up Shit's Creek. She'd have to serve her original <laughs> sentence now. It's going to cost her money to they'll fine her. And she owes money because she ran into a bus. And yet that's, that's redefined. Isn't AA great? Because eventually people get the message that they're really screwing up their life and they should never, ever drink again, even though that r virtually never happens. It's not like a person. I think she's hmm. in her tw She's 28, I think. She's not going to go to rehab and never have another drink. That You'd have to bet your life on that. So I'm, I'm, 
number of the, the invention of harm reduction. Uh, how would how would you define harm reduction? Well, I, I don't like that term. I think it's just more psychobabble. And I think words like uh, common sense, uh, prevention, uh, making good decisions are, are much better. Uh, you know, that, that's been around since the dawn of humanity. But it seems like people who are into addiction science are always making up new terms for old things. Good enough for me. Good enough for me. Um, I mean, they used to call harm, one name for harm reduction used to be controlled drinking or safe drinking. Um, but I mean, but, but you, you're right. The accusation you can make against me is, oh, Stan Peel's just talking about common sense. I mean, yeah. for God's sake, what a crazy idea. The entire, and I agree with you in large extent, the entire addiction field is built on a pyramid of bullshit and misunderstanding. Well, you can never <laughs> drink again. If you drink once, you're bound to. You know, in AA, you have to go back to ground zero, your zero days of, re of sobriety. Um, common sense says that you hone in on your life, become better able to adapt to your life, become more successful at reducing your addiction and leading a more generally satisfying life. And in fact, the data show that the large majority of addicted to drugs and alcohol people will naturally recover. Natural recovery is a major, perhaps you know some people. Um, right. I mean, anyone who knows someone who stopped smoking, I mean, smoking is very yeah. addictive. Most people quit on their own. But I'm, I'm curious, why do you use this term addiction? Because you don't see addiction as a medical problem, I take well, it. You, the word you addiction see it as something proceeds, different, right? You know the word addiction existed before AA and the brain disease. Right. I mean, what, addiction is an, ancient, is an old English word. I mean, right, right. I'm not going to eliminate a word that exists. And what I mean, what do you imagine addiction meant? Before they invented the disease theory, what do you think addiction, the word meant? Uh, I think it meant in a, a fondness for something, something you cho you chose to addict yourself it meant, to. It meant a fondness um, for something to an extreme extent, with possibly preoccupying and negative consequences. That that's an English word. They might say, "Well, he's addicted hmm. to his lover." I mean, they would have addicted to his smoking. They would have addicted to rum. Um, and then maybe you would say it's a little offbeat. They're not saying you're definitely sick, but it indicates an, an unbalanced life. He's addicted to X or Y. Hmm. So that word existed. It had a common sense meaning. <clears throat> People didn't go out bragging, you know, wanting to be addicted. It was a concept. Mm -hmm. That concept got medicalized. And so, ironically, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I'm trying to demedicalize a term to have its standard mindfulness meaning. Let me give you another example that's popular. <clears throat> what percentage of Americans would you guess have had an um, opioid painkiller in their lives? Oh, probably 80% or more. Exactly. You're on top of things, Aaron. I like you. And what percentage of those people <laughs> okay. get addicted? Um, I would guess less than 1%. You're, you're doing Wait, all my material now. And why don't people, have, I, you, perhaps you've had an opioid painkiller. Yeah, I've had my wisdom teeth taken out and they gave me some kind of opioid So why drug, didn't you take didn't them and say, oh my God, these are so great, I'm going to go out and get a ton of these. Why didn't that happen? Oh, well, I had other things that were more important to do I mean, in my life. reading my books. I mean, that's the correct answer. <laughs> I mean, most people don't find, we'll call that experience of being under an opioid narcosis. Most people don't. It's disorienting. It can make you feel, you know, in a, a sea wash. And there's sometimes some pleasant aspect to that. But most people don't say, wow, this is so great. I want to go out, quit my job, and leave my family to re 
experience that experience. That's just not how people work. So if it's a disease, right. you don't have a choice to do that. In real life, you experience the opioid. You have a life and connections. You have things to do. I, I, we're getting back to your horrible accusation. Dr. Peel, you're just talking common sense, for God's sake. I don't need an expert on to say, you know, and 95% of people, 99% of people are going to say, you know, I'm just going to vote for my regular, you know, my wife and husband and my kids, my job, living in my house, walking my dog, you know, the normal life as opposed to, well, geez, this was so great. I want to go out buy someone the street and do this, you know, five times a day. That's that's not how people work. And so this gets back to your point, conceiving of addiction as a disease and believing that image actually makes it more likely, you might say, oh, I can't control myself. I'm taking opioids. This experience is dragging me down as opposed to you know, what your mother or father, well, I was watching, you know, Morning Joe one time, and we were in the middle of the opioid crisis. Well, we're still in the middle of the opioid crisis. And um, Mika says something like, you know, one of my daughters runs track. She hurt her knee. We're giving her painkillers. But I'm, you know, going to make sure that she, you know, deals with them respectfully and gets off them, which we like call mindfulness. Right. You know, people do, they take out, al drink alcohol. In Europe, they even smoke cigarettes, but they're mindful of where that fits into their lives and they behave accordingly and appropriately. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of the most alluring things about calling something uh, a disease, uh, like addiction, is that it absolves the person of responsibility and it lets others around them absolve that person of their responsibility to live a good life. Because if you, I mean, it's very hard to accept that people use their own free will to screw up their lives and make bad choices. And by calling it a, a disease, that in a way absolves them of their sin. And we can extend that out uh, further. And, so what happens if somebody near to you becomes addicted now how do you deal with it well you, if you're rich it's not the betty ford well, center or something like that. well let me let me stop you there you said becomes addicted you 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 don't I, w I would maybe preface that and say do you become addicted or do you choose to become addicted do you decide to be addicted well I, decide and become I mean, is, are, are fancy words of intentionality some people become addicted Hmm. You know, and I'm not a person who says, oh, they decided to or they became addicted because of X, Y, and Z. I, I have this life process program. I say, I don't even tell people, well, I don't, you're right. I don't use the word addicted in therapy. A person comes in okay. and they say, they're there, you know, they're paying some money. They got, there's right. something happening in their lives that's not working for them. Um, they know my program and I am connected with addiction, and that might have to do with a love relationship, um, food, even exercise, gambling. And sometimes they want to know if they're addicted, and what I say to them instead is, well, let's hold, you can make that decision. You know, why are you here? You're not feeling comfortable about something, are you? And they'll say, well, I'm worried about my eating or my gambling. And I'll say, why are you worried? And they'll say, well, I lost my paycheck. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, my wife says, if I don't stop, she's going to throw me out of the house. And I say, okay, let's just focus on those things for, let's just talk about them. You know, why did you spend your whole paycheck? Why is your wife upset about that? Uh, what's your relationship with your wife like? Um, what did you get out of, you know, when you were gambling? Tell me what those feelings were like. 
why were those positive for the time being, like just being completely absorbed in something? And I don't really need to make any inputs at all. And you can't make any inputs at all. You can't say, oh, you should be nicer to your wife. You can't say, oh, those are irrational feelings you're having that you, that you like so much. You can only explore them with the person and have them understand the con. So in a way, we're doing an existential audit. We're saying, you tell me what this thing is doing for you. You tell me if that's starting not to work for you. You tell me what makes that true. You know, I love my wife. I, I don't want to piss her off. You know, I like being married. And I say, OK. And then in relate, you know, I'm doing a quick version of all this, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what would it look like for you to <clears throat> avoid this particular problem? You know, gamble as an, and then, you, you know, you, you just work it all the way out. Uh, how would you gamble this? You know, yeah, and you can even throw curveballs at them. You say, oh, gosh, I guess there's no way you can gamble this. You can see where, you know, people are going to say, no, I didn't say that. Oh, I, I thought you were saying that. They could say, no, I, you know, I like to, I used to play basketball. I could play basketball instead. You know, to tell you the truth, I haven't been spending enough time with my children. I could take them, you know, out to eat, you know, on a weekend night when I'm most prone to get. They can, they've got all the answers. I know, mm. I know what it looks like for people to become addicted and unaddicted. I know how that looks. Um, and I'm helping them travel down that common sense path because we I agree with you. We fancify it up the whole thing so much. Oh, here, here's an MRI of the brain. That's really going to help people. Or mm. even giving them a medication is <laughs> going to help yeah. them. We've simply got to have a person bring their life in line with the values that make them happiest and, you know, allow them or assist them to make those connections, which are people make all the time logically and connect up. If you if I, I'll go to an audience and I'll say, what's the toughest addiction to quit? And these are recovering people and they all shout out smoking. And I say, wow, huh? Has anybody in this room quit smoking? You know, and if they're counselors by now, 70% of the people raise their hands. You know, and I've been in rooms where that's 500 people. And I say, oh, so wow, that's great that you all quit the hardest addiction to quit. How many of you went to a support group or therapy to quit smoking? And you know, 500 people have said they quit smoking and two people raise their hand. And I said, man, you guys are too yeah. radical for me. You're all in recovery. And 99% of you, a bunch of you, majority of you have quit the toughest addiction to quit. And virtually none of you got any formal assistance to do it. And now they're buzzing and uncomfortable. And then I say, what made you quit? You know, and I call on some people and of course they have the stupidest by stupidest i mean they're just like life reasons you know i got pneumonia and i just had you know a baby daughter you know i'm not going to kill myself when i just had a baby who's going to do that <laughs> and then yeah. somebody will object they'll say well i tried to quit for 12 years it took me 12 years to quit and i say okay and you quit after 12 years? And they say, yeah. And I said, what enabled you to quit after 12 years? And they say something like, well, I sort of got better at it. You know, I quit once for three years. And then I went back. Okay. And then I said to myself, well, I, I know I can quit. And, and, you know, I'm getting older. And, you know, I read about people dying. You know, they're just a set of human motivations and experiences that people can access. But they're not... A disease. Remember, the, the title of my program is the Life Process Program. Addiction, getting into it and out of it, which is, I think you were chastised, upbraiding me for saying it was 
uh, addiction is a thing. It's a life process that okay. people engage in that gets them there and gets them out of there. And the life process is having a home, having a family, having a job, having values that counteracted, like values towards being healthy, wanting to stay alive, and a slow dawning and mindfulness about your life and concern. You know, when you talk to a 30, a 50-year-old, a 40-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 20-year-old, and you say, what's important to you? They give you different answers. For a 20-year-old smoking marijuana and drinking until they're fucked up and smoking cigarettes even sort of makes sense. I go to a party and I feel better. When they're 30 and they're maybe getting married and settled down, when they're 40 and they've got a family, when they're 50 and they're thinking about going into old age, it's a whole different sequence. And there's nothing magical about it. You know, how old are you? I'm 39. You think differently than when you were 22. And and if we yeah. said that, everybody in the world would say, of course. Right. You know, what the hell did he have to worry about when he was 22? He had to, things to worry about, but, <laughs> you know, smoking cigarettes wasn't, or drinking too much wasn't something that people were going to dump on you for if you're, you know, living in a fraternity or some dorm room. So... I agree with you. Diseasing of America is about turning normal life circumstances and values into something fancy, cut out cardboard pastiche. And it actually, the crazy thing is, it actually makes dealing with addiction like problems harder and less successful. You know, we had an all time record number of drug deaths this past year. You know, I began this conversation by saying something like, you know, when we discovered penicillin or tuberculosis germ or pneumonia or smallpox, we eliminated them. Addiction is the only disease where discovering it, elaborating it, and educating people about it makes them more likely to succumb to it. And we're proud of it. Look how bad the problem is. <laughs> yeah. Nora Volko was the head of the yeah. NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, since 2003. In 2007, she did an interview with the New York Times. And she, she's called a general in the drug war. Um, and she says, well, oh, oh, painkillers are now the biggest cause of addiction problems. Since that time, 75 uh uh, 750,000 Americans have died from drug use, and the rate, annual death rate uh, from drug deaths has quintupled. Now, you might think that poor Nora Volko, I really feel sorry for, you know what I mean? If the secretary, the head of the NIDA stays on, but if the secretary of Depre of of uh, Secretary of the Treasury or Economic Development, if we have a depression, they fire his ass or her ass. You know what I mean? They say it may or may not be his or her fault, but he ain't, they're not keeping this job. But Nora Volko is blossoming. <laughs> oh my God, the problems right. that we have to deal with are so bad. We need more of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I hear you there. I mean, I, it, it sounds like we have some similar beliefs. I, um, you know, when you you were talking first at a, uh, when you're counseling people, you're trying to get to get them to think about, okay, why are you doing this? How is this helping you? I think Freud talked about that. He called that secondary gain. You know, there there are reasons for why we behave the way we do, and if we don't understand those reasons, you're just like a a, a bumbling idiot bouncing around. You've got to know why you act the way you do. What are your reasons and what are you now, the way from? I differ from you know, Freud I, I, and some other people is that exercise I limit to some degree. I'm, I don't explore their trauma for two months. I say, what does it do for you in the here and now? Why is gambling seem to be a reasonable or an alluring thing for you to do right now in terms of how you feel and how you live right now? And I'll let them talk about, well, you know, I'm anxious about having a family because my own family didn't my that I grew up in didn't work well. 
and it produces anxiety in me being concerned about that. Obvious, it's a legitimate truth. It's something we need to be aware of. But I'm not going to spend five hours talking about, you know, a bad relationship with his father. I, I will say something yeah. like, you prefer to have a better relationship with your children than the one you have with your father. Is And how is your behavior feeding into that? Are you... And the person says, oh, well, that's one of the things I'm worried about. I mean, I'm speeding this all up. That's one of the things I'm worried about. And I said, is there anything you could do about that worry? And the answers are, you know, well, I could drink less, not smoke, mm -hmm. not go out and gamble on weekends. Um, it's all common sense. And... But the important thing about what you said, Freud wants to know the reasons. The good thing about harm reduction is it's non judgmental. You're not there to say, AA says you have to make amends and you have to list all the sins you've done against people. Well, you know, obviously, when a person comes in and they spend some money to deal with the way they're behaving, they're not 100% happy. But my job isn't to make them less happy about themselves and their lives. My job is to make open a window for them, which that window says, here's a route to make yourself less unhappy. We can, you can do that. And I'll help you. Mm -hmm. I've seen it done. I know it can be done. I Believe me, I know it can be done. You can do it. And encouraging them with the, it's called efficacy, or agency to believe that they can improve their, that's the most important essential ingredient. People are demoralized sometimes. And it's amazing how often, if you say to somebody, you know, you're fucked up for life. You know, you can never drink <laughs> again. You know, you were traumatized by your family. You're never going to get over that. Those are all disempowering statements and the single most critical thing you need to do to help a person is to say you know we're not here to approve of anything that you're guilty about or that you've done wrong but we're here to enable you to see that you have the power in yourself not a higher power to improve your life to remedy those things and to proceed in a more constructive way from here on in. Yeah, that's, that's another thing that when you medicalize something, it's, it's almost like you're, you're depersonalizing it when with addictions, it's a very personal thing. And I, I think that taking away that power by saying, Oh, you can't control this. And you're saying on the other hand, wait a minute, you can, and, and you can do this to my mind. That's a much more empowering helpful viewpoint than someone who says you, you can't control you know, this. It, you know, I had one question. In real life, go ahead. We've gotten away from, we don't call people crippled anymore. You don't label people except in AA and rehab, you have to declare that you're an alcoholic. It's sort of like screw yeah. all that modern way of thinking. We're AA or we're the brain disease, or we're the trauma people. We want you to get up and admit that you're powerless, that you have a disease, and we want you to label yourself that. Proudly say, I'm an alcoholic. You don't go to a person with a reading disability and say, oh, you know, except to the extent that you have an AA mindset, say, oh, uh, I'm permanently disabled. Uh, when people say to you, who are you? I'm going to say I'm a reading disabled person. And, and that, <laughs> everybody knows that that's crazy. If you do that to a child, yeah. I don't know, they'd arrest you. If you have a child who bites right. your nails, you don't say, oh, that's a disease you'll never get over. If you have a child who wets their bed, you don't say, oh, you're doomed forever to wet your bed. You have this disease that nobody's ever, nobody does that. Everybody knows that's 
crazy and stupid and self defeating. Yeah. So a lot of it's the I disease so. theory, which sort of they teach in the schools now. To a certain basic extent, every thinking person knows it's nonsensical and illogical and it's not something they really want to do. So there's a question that you have to answer. Why do people have to go to rehab so many times? And why do they fight the idea of being called an alcoholic and that they have a disease and they can never, why do they do that? And the end, AA, um, a single drunken woman is about how you have to pulverize the person down until they stop believing, until they stop resisting that. But if you actually have a way to help people, you don't have to fight them. You don't have to go in and say, oh, you stupid idiot. Don't you realize you're in denial that you're actually a powerless alcohol? You don't have to fight with a person if you believe and they believe that together you have a way of improving your life. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, Thomas Saws I, uh, wrote about how we live in a therapeutic state and now uh, everything has been medicalized. Uh, are you familiar with Saws's work? Um, yeah. Um, what do you, what do you, you know, you mentioned that you were one of the first to uh, come up with this idea that addiction isn't a disease. I've, I found out about you by reading um, Jeffrey Shaler's book, Addiction is a Choice. Are you familiar with that book? Oh, you didn't notice that Jeffrey Shaler thanked me for helping him to write that book and providing a lot of the references for him. Oh, so, yeah. I'm familiar with Jeffrey Shaler. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but it sounds like you guys have very similar uh, viewpoints on that. We all, we do. Um, I avoid saying addiction is a choice and that – as you started out saying, there's no such thing as addiction. I mean, there are people that kill themselves, you know, and they kill themselves in a variety. Of, you know, they smoke too much. They drink too much. I mean, that woman who got in the car could have killed herself. Um, what would you say was the addiction that causes the most death objectively? If you had to add up all the numbers. Um, the addiction that causes the most death. I don't know. That's, that's a tough one. I guess, uh, I'd say love addiction. It's the source, the greatest source of both murder and suicide. You know, when people hmm. quit smoking, sometimes, sometimes they do it fairly easily. And sometimes it drives them up a wall. They don't kill themselves. When people quit heroin, they don't kill themselves. Well, Freud said uh, if he if he didn't have smoking, life wouldn't be worth living. So there, there's that. Well, but but I agree with you in general. After he got lung cancer, I agree with your greater point in general, though that things other than drugs are probably well. I mean, you know, there's a million death, stories more. I could tell you. There's the identical twins who were dating the same man, and one of the identical twins took a kitchen knife and stabbed her identical sister to death. Oh, my gosh. That, that happens. Things like that happen all the time. Um, okay. Um, Why do you tell that story? So rather than be deprived of a loved object, and obviously your adorable person would say, <clears throat> How good a love object is this if he's screwing your sister, too? But she's so convinced of her need that she can't live without this person that she kills her rival who happens to be her identical sister. Now, we're getting back to the thing where you quoted Freud. In some addicted way, that makes sense to her. Unfortunately, she'll be in prison for the rest of her life and she's murdered her sister. But in some insane, bizarre way, she feels she's guaranteed that she can now have this thing that's destructive, 
but that she needs beyond all belief to exist. And, you know, when you're in prison, they don't let you date. So that's, she's lost it anyhow. Um, and we were by the internal logic of addiction. And obviously this person wasn't a good person for self-control. Um, it actually sort of makes sense when people kill themselves or somebody else. That's a severe addiction. And, Hmm. They people do that more often intentionally with love than anything else. I mean, people can die using heroin or smoking, but not because they're deprived of it. They don't say, oh, my God, I have to give up heroin. I'll kill myself. They might be unhappy about it. But people all the time say, if I lose this loved one, that's my entire encompassing of my being. I can't continue to exist. So, you know, there are people whose lives take a downward trend. Their behavior kills them. I, you know how George McGovern's daughter died? She no. got out of rehab. She was living in a halfway house in Milwaukee. She bought a bottle of scotch. She drank it all, and she froze to death on the street. The man, okay. what do you call that? What word would you call that? I, I, you know, I'm not sure. I'd have to think more about it, but I, I'd call that a bad choice. I don't – what would you call well, it? Well, it was a bad choice. It was the tail end of a lot of bad choices. She didn't just start drinking that night. She had a bad relationship okay. to okay. alcohol. How, how would you describe a relationship to alcohol? Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'd have to know the person more. I'd have to talk to the person. You don't think that saying she had an addictive relationship with alcohol would be a economical way of describing her behavior? That not not really. That doesn't strike me as a very uh, a useful term as an outsider. Maybe if I was more well, you, uh, you, you, that's what you enveloped. You think saying she made a bad choice. After she was in halfway house, after having been in rehab, is more illustrative or illuminating than say she had an addictive relationship with alcohol. Do you feel that saying she made a bad choice is a more elucidating concept than saying she was addicted to alcohol? By which I meant hmm. it provided some sense of gratification in a sea, in a world of uncertainty and anxiety that she was willing to opt for even when its consequences were the most dire consequences possible. She died in the street for God's sake. That's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, yeah. I don't, well, I think know, this, I have a, the second way you said it makes more, makes more sense. I have a brother when, who when you committed just... suicide. I only had one sibling and my brother committed suicide. I had three children. Sorry, I never man. once said to my children, oh, you're in danger of committing suicide because it runs in our family. I never once said that. How do you think, but, you know, it's, I'm aware of it, and I'm aware of my brother. What would you think would be some of the ways, without ever having a discussion like, oh, you're prone to commit suicide, that's a gene in our family, what would you think would be some of the ways that I would make it less likely or unlikely that they would ever commit suicide? I mean, probably by by loving them, by teaching them good life skills, good habits, things like that. Well put. By having them um, enjoy life, having them love themselves, uh, having them feel that the world, I mean, my brother committed suicide at a point, he was an adult, when he felt his life choices were closed off to him. Um, mm. So, A, you want them to have good life choices. When I say life choices, I don't mean, well, they made a good decision crossing the street that morning. I want them to have good life options, skills, the lead of okay. satisfying life, be able to have relationships and intimacy, be have that positive attitudes towards health. Um. I want them to be independent and even adventurous. 
Now, if we, we stop back to our initial discussion, you're going to say, Dr. Peel, all you're talking about is good child rearing habits. You know, I mean, basically every good parent understands what you're saying. It's not magical. But right. it, it's, it's, it's back to the life process program. Grounding your child in themselves and in life in dealing with the world, respecting themselves in the world. It's an arduous and involved process, but it's the only antidote for addiction and mental health, including depression and suicide. And, and hmm. so, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I never once, I had a wife whose father had been an alcoholic. I would cut off my finger before I would have said to my children, oh, alcoholism runs in the family. I would never utter those words. He wasn't an alcoholic by the time they met, the older kids met him. He had calmed down by the time he was in his 70s. It took too long, but that's the way it goes sometimes in life. And mm -hmm. I taught them to respect him and they loved him. Um. But I would never infiltrate their minds with the idea that they've inherited something that they can't control. And if, they, if I saw somebody who was misbehaving with alcohol, I would say, what do you think of that behavior? Um, and my kids would all know the answer to that. They would all say, you don't like it. I say, why don't I like it? Mm. And they would say, because it's, you know, screwing up the room it's making people uncomfortable. It makes him or her look ridiculous. It's basic values that you've taught a person, which gets back to why do people like disease things so much? I, I, people aren't going to call me a great father. None of my kids has ever been in rehab. They might have had a few issues. None of them has ever been in a mental institution. All of them have good jobs and good skills and intimate relationships. That took a little bit of doing, you know, that's not takes a little bit of work. And and if they would have gone off the tracks, how would have I responded? I, you know, I would have felt horrible. My mother in law used to say, you're only as happy as your most unhappy child. That was one of her Romanian sayings. Mm. And, you know, if your child is severely distressed, that can dominate your life. And so when that happens, you're not in a good mood for saying, oh, you're not in a good mood for saying, um, what did I do wrong? What could I have done better? And what you need to be in the mood for is saying, well, how are we going to take this going forward? And the shortcut answer is to say, oh, He's depressed or he's got an addiction gene, which relieves, as you described, all of the anxiety and all of the uncertainty. But it's not a road forward. It's a crippling labeling that, if anything, indemnifies the very thing you're trying to eradicate. Yeah, yeah. So if people like what you're saying in there, agreeing with you, where do they start off with learning more about this way of thinking about addiction? Well, where do they go? Where do they well, start with? There is something called, if they're concerned about a problem, we have something called lifeprocessprogram.com. They can go to my website. They can go to the lifeprocessprogram.com website and you don't have to sign up for therapy. There are descriptions and re there's uh, articles there you can read, like some that you've read. I have a website called peel.net. You can rifle through some of the key articles there. I've written some classic books, Love and Addiction, Diseasing of America that you held up. Um, I have a self-help book called The Truth About Addiction and Recovery. I have another one called Seven Tools to Beat Addiction. I have one about child rearing called Addiction Proof Your Child. You know, so you can look up Peel on Amazon or wherever you purchase your books. Pick one, you know, for your leisurely reading on Saturday rather than going out gambling or stabbing your identical twin <laughs> sister to death. Not mulling. That's a bad joke. 
Uh. My material is out there. And the most important thing, Aaron, is, and, and you know, I'm going to have to give you credit for this, kind of forget everything you think you know about addiction. You and I have said some radical things here today. My books can be kind of radical. What's he? He's not saying what AA is saying. Relax. Open your mind and just say, well, let's think this problem up from ground zero. You know, like what do they call it? Zero base accounting. Let's just start at the mm -hmm. bottom and build our way up and see what kind of a structure we get following Dr. Peel's re lead if we're reading. You know, it's still, if you buy a book, it's still $10. It ain't $50,000 for you know, a month at Betty Ford or Hazleton. Mull over the ideas and suspend your disbelief in terms of whatever anybody, what has been fed to you from school on. Or you might do the exercise that you described or I described. If you're out for dinner, if you're an adult with a bunch of people, you might say, oh, is anybody in this table ever quit an addiction? Oh, let's make it legal addictions. Anybody in this table ever quit smoking? You know, chances are a couple of people are going to raise their hand. And you say, wow, I heard that's really a hard addiction to quit. How did you do it? And then they'll tell you some, quote, goofy reason, you know. You know, I decided I wanted to run, become a runner. Uh, my daughter came home from school and said, Daddy, do you know you're killing yourself? Don't you love me? I mean, it's going to be some human, human factoid. And then ask yourself, what is this story in my actual, and if you quit smoking, ask yourself the, I? Um, if the person we're talking to, how can they learn the way we're thinking? If a person quit smoking themselves, how did that happen? That truth, which resides in you, is actually more illuminating than all the bullshit you're going to see on television and learn from watching Single Drunken Woman. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Where's the best place to follow you? Follow you? Are you on Twitter? Do you post on your website? I, What's the I, best I'm, place for I updates? Do, basically, I do a weekly podcast lately with a man named Zach Rhodes. Um, it, the, uh, if you... If you look up, gosh, I should have a better reference for it. I, I think it might be called Life Process Program Podcasts. I do have a YouTube channel, and I have lately been putting up podcasts there, which are a little more intellectual than the ones in the Life Process Program. But if you search my name on the Internet, you, you know, you'll find me. So far, I haven't been canceled, so I'm kind of out there. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the call with me tonight. It was great talking with Aaron, you. Aaron, thanks for having me so much. Um, I'll just hold up my, this is my life story, which is sort of, in your terms, here's a man who told common sense and he had a fight for his ideas for his entire adult life. And thanks for having me on. I couldn't have enjoyed myself more, Aaron. Excellent. Adios.